Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of Technology and the Law. Uh, my name is Frank Jennings, the Cloud Lawyer. Um, and today I'm joined by John Easton from IBM, uh, Rick Powell from Druva, Chris Bridgeland from Veritas, and Sue McClure from Persona. Uh, today we're talking about uh, GDPR and data location. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to turn to you, John. One definition of cloud is someone else's computer. Um, are, you, are your customers comfortable with data being stored on someone else's computer, your computer? Um, so I, th I think we see a lot of clients using our cl cloud platform as they use many cloud platforms. So I don't think people necessarily, necessarily see that there's a problem there as long as they know where the data is, they know how it's being processed, they know who has or hasn't got access to it, and they can do the things that they need to do, because obviously they're using our computer to actually you know, achieve a particular business goal or business objective. And Sue, how do you feel about um, your data being stored in someone else's computer? I think it's one of those things, people talk about the cloud as if it's an actual cloud, and you sort of think it is actually a box still. You know, there are still partitions and security around it. Um, so there is a bit of a fear factor up front about it's not mine and I can't see it, but I think that is waning. I think people are getting used to the idea of as long as it's well looked after and secure. Actually, I don't necessarily know where it is, and I'm not going to bother finding out um, as long as I know I have the securities in place. When I speak to people, um, they, they come from one of two angles. Either it, the data has to be located in the basement and on premise, the old, old school style, yeah. I know where it is, I can put my arms around it, yeah. and therefore it must be safe, which is, um, which is a, a little on the wrong side, uh, you might say. Um, and then you've got other people who are, who are fully embraced with, with, um, with cloud. And why do you think that data is such an issue, Chris? Well, data, I think, data location. I think, I think data location is, is one of those one of those concepts that people need to get a comfort that I think we've already discussed the, the security angle associated with that that data and the the understanding of what that data is is, is absolutely I think the biggest key aspect for most organisations and anybody you know I, putting my photos from my phone and loading them up to a, a cloud service I'm quite happy to do that however taking my financial records and posting that up onto the cloud service suddenly becomes something that I get a little bit more nervous about about what I'm going to actually do with that or so what somebody might be able to do with that. And, and, and is that because the cloud is inherently in secure do you think or is, where does that fear come from? I th well, I think the, is it the, the fear that the, if it's not in the basement it must be insecure? The, the fear is that I'm not too sure whereabouts it is and, and somebody's given me assurances but I just need to know that I, those assurances are absolutely well founded. So, And do you need to know where it is specifically, it's got to be um, in Stamford Street in, in SE1 in London, or is London enough, or is it the UK enough, or what, what, what's the fear there? I think uh, in many organisations that, that, that we're working with at the moment have a sense of understanding and classifying their data, classifying their information effectively, to be able to choose what data are they prepared to allow to go into the cloud and what data there isn't. And most organisations, like ourselves, we use we use cloud ap applications for, for running our sales programmes and our sales activities and understanding what we're doing. Now, that to a large degree has very sensitive data that you know could be competitive. But being able to turn around and actually say we understand the risks associated with that and the controls yeah. around it effectively, and we're comfortable with those, means that we've done a good risk and impact analysis and a risk assessment about doing a cloud-based approach to doing things versus a, an on-premise where I can look and see blinking lights and everything else and understand that my data's there. Blinking lights, I like the 1970s yeah. analogy there. Um, and, and Rick, um, what, what do your customers say? Is it, is it UK, it's got to be UK, or, or are they comfortable anywhere? What are people telling you? I think different companies in different countries have very different views as to how they want to protect and capture and recover their data. <coughs> Um, the most apposite example, I think, is in, in the UK. Uh, companies are taking a hybrid approach. To Chris's point, there's certain data they still feel uncomfortable putting into a public cloud environment, and other data, file, print and share type data, they're very happy to pass off. Yeah. They don't need to, co to, to, to worry about the cost. They don't want to worry about the complexity. They want to reduce their infrastructure costs. So they're making informed judgments as to what data they can put into a public domain. You get other examples, and we perhaps in our preamble talked about Germany. Um, vastly different views there. We have customers, large customers, very happy to put their data into a public cloud environment. Others, 
almost paranoid about so doing at the end of the day. So I think it's, a, it's an evolutionary process. I think it's a comfort process. And without a doubt, the public cloud is expanding at a rapid pace for organizations and much of yeah. the are for consumers. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it's, um, this is a journey that's going to go on and on. And Sue, if I can turn back to you, is, is Germany a particular issue? for your business? Is, is, is it even an issue? No, not really, because I think it comes back to what are you going to be doing with the data that you're, you're storing and how are you going to be using it and how are you going to be exploiting it and is what you're doing with it appropriate anyway? Because that will be the point at which people are worried where you're storing it. Um, that's the point yeah. at which they will touch um, that is a problem to me. So they're um, concerned about where it is then? Um, uh, I think they only become concerned about where it is at the point at which they're wondering about what you're doing with it. Um, because is, is what you're doing with it inappropriate to their uh, needs because it is being governed by the law of the land as to where it is? If it's in the US and it's lots of digital data and engagement data, um, is it being shared with every other supplier in the US because they're far more open with their data protection than we are in Europe, for example? If it's stored in Germany, in um, the US, and they're not doing that, then I was going to ask So, so the, the key here, and this is uh, um, one of the key issues I want to drive uh, from today's episode is, is that it's not so much the location, it's the, um, it's the protections that you put around the data which is held in that particular location. Yeah. So sp people assume that um, data is automatically safe because it's uh, held in their basement, where it's actually the, if you haven't gone through all the checks and balances that you might um, for a, a cloud-based or an external uh, location, then perhaps you don't have the same protections. Um, whereas just because it's in the cloud, it doesn't necessarily mean it's secure. Um, and yet, I've yet to speak to a, a cloud provider who says that, um, come put all your data in our cloud because it's insecure. Mm. Um, no, nobody <laughs> would stay in business very long if they're selling um, cloud on the basis that it's insecure. So, so in that respect, then, it, the, the location matters um, less to, to the degree in which the, the data is protected. Would you agree, Rick? I do. I don't, I, don't, I don't think... I think the issue of having to convince customers that public cloud is a safe place to put data. That conversation is over as far as I'm concerned at the end of the day. The classification, the accreditations that the large public cloud providers have got are, are extraordinary these days. That to me isn't the issue. The conversations I have with customers are, their greatest concern is, to I think Sue's point, if I am a company in geographic location A and the organization that is hosting my data is in geographic location B, and they have different rules and regulations and policies and procedures under their government and legislation, and they could unilaterally decide to access my data, I have a problem with that. Now, you can, we know through the, the, the people around this table, we can provide protection against that, but that's their greatest concern at the end of the day. Who can access this data without my authority? That's my rules, not yours. Indeed, yeah. absolutely. So that, that's my interpretation of what I see and hear every day. And I've had people quoting the law at me, um, which, which is always fascinating. <laughs> Non-lawyers telling me what the law mm. is, um, uh, as if I'm the only person out there who hasn't read the Data Protection Act. Um, and they say that um, data, my data has to be kept inside of, you name it, London, the UK, Europe, depending upon their extensive knowledge of, of the geography of, of the world. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's somewhere. cities they can know. Uh, it's it's exactly. Um, <laughs> Uh, and N uh, the NHS England apparently has a, a, a requirement to keep N um, NHS England data inside of England, and I've yet to be able to trace that down. So if anybody watching today can push me in the right, right direction, they'll be uh, very keen to know. But um, certainly from, from a UK perspective, there's, there's no reason why yeah. it shouldn't be able to, to flow. At, at, a, at a general level, personal data should be able to flow within the UK, but also the European economic area. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole purpose of the Data Protection Directive was that it doesn't have to stay in Germany, it can also be, uh, be stored in, in the UK. Is that what you're seeing, John? Do, do customers specifically point to you saying, um, I've got German data, do I have to keep it in your German data center, or are they comfortable with it being in the UK or so, France? So, so I think, again, comes back to the different sorts of data that we have there. You know, we, we have gone very much for um, a, a very much local data center. So we have data in the UK and in France and in Germany. And, you know, various other places around Europe, specifically to give clients that want to have it stored in country the opportunity to do that. You know, now whether that is driven by um, legislative demands or whether that is driven by a, a customer preference is really not for us to say. And the, and the other thing that we will say is that you know you put the data there. 
um, we're not going to move it anywhere. So if you want to move it from, let's say, from Germany into the Netherlands, you can move it to the Netherlands, but we're not going to actually make that sort of move for you. And actually, it even then goes beyond that of saying, you know, if we give you access to the bare hardware, you can encrypt that data to whatever level of encryption you want. So you have control. Yeah. You know, that's the key, the key thing. So put in place the um, facilities you need to keep you happy, you the customer happy, that you are able to meet your legal requirements, you are able to meet your company policy requirements, and you're able to do what you need to do with the data wherever it happens to be. So the legislation talks about um, having appropriate technical and organisational measures to keep the data secure. Is, do you have a, a particular set of requirements, Sue, when you're looking to store data, or do you, mm -hmm. do you just rely upon the, the representations from the cloud provider? Yes, it's secure. Like, like I said, I've yet to meet anybody to say it, it's, it's insecure, but so is that enough for you, or do you have a list of requirements? So my favourite word is appropriate. The, yeah. the appropriate, a particular legal word, depending on, well, appropriate for what and for, for <laughs> whom and in what circumstance. Um, so, so there will be there'll be different rules around how secure it has to be. As I think Rick said earlier, depending on what it is and what you're doing with it. Um, but if I'm honest, so any financial, properly personal sensitive data, you do go through the um, the whole security. What physical uh, security do you have, as well as what cyber security do you have? Yes. Um, but beyond that. Uh, no, it, it varies. Same so the privilege. legislation is deliberately vague, and some, sometimes lawyers and, and legislators generally get a hard time for saying that the law doesn't keep up with technology, as, as if that's a massive revelation. Um, <laughs> in my experience, the law never keeps up with technology, and it'd be foolhardy to try to do so. The, the, so the, the wording in the legislation is deliberately vague, because what was appropriate a month ago is not necessarily appropriate today. Is it, is it appropriate that you have measures which don't take into account ransomware. Well, if you if you'd had that conversation a month ago, the answer might have been slightly different. Yeah, now yeah. it's all about ransomware because of the, uh, the, the, the recent attacks. And what might be relevant or appropriate in, in a month or, or a year's time might, might change again. At the moment, the Information Commissioner isn't requiring all data to be encrypted uh, at rest on a, on a server. Although, as you say, you give customers the, the means to be able to do whatever they like with it. But certainly she has said that if you take data out on a mobile device away from your safe environment, from your office or working environment, then it does have to be encrypted. And, and there are numerous examples of people who've taken data out on USB sticks or yeah. phones or And you've just hit the nail on the head. Our biggest risk is not technology, it's people. That's our, always going to be our biggest risk. When I, when I advise clients, there's always people, process, and technology, and probably in that order, actually, yeah, is, is you yeah. do need to have the technology, the appropriate measures to keep data secure. But if you've got a disgruntled employee or, or frankly, an ignorant employee, yeah. um, you're always going to have a, uh, have a risk of, of data, data leaking out. Yeah, and, and, and actually, in that sense, the cloud is no better or worse than an on-premise system be because, yes. you know, if yeah. you don't set a password or it's yeah. a trivial password, whether it's in the cloud or whether it's on-premises, you know, it's easy for someone to get like in. Which feels a different conversation to location. Yeah. It feels like sure. process, I mean, we, we, yeah. We've had some situations recently where some customers are actually re-evaluating what they're doing in the cloud. There's been some fairly public cloud outages, which actually they took some of their quite sensitive or, or, or business impactful systems out, put them in the cloud, and those those they suddenly were out of service for you know 24 hours or so, and so they're looking at you know okay, did we take that one step too far? Did we? What was our impact analysis when we were deciding to make make the move to that way? Did we actually take those sorts of things into consideration? So, the cloud is absolutely a, a great place to go, but you've got to understand the what if scenarios that are absolutely going to affect you. And now, if you're in the cloud with lots of other people, then how can somebody pick out your data versus versus somebody else's data? And all those sorts of things come into play. But again, the wrappers and the and the effect that they, they're going to put the security mechanisms and the controls in place yeah. and make sure that everything's up and running is, is key. But to, but to Frank's point and Sue's as well, <clears throat> we, we all understand that typically the data that's sitting in the data center on the servers that, uh, as Frank says, uh, people like to put their arms around and kiss goodbye every night. That's uh, that's pretty well understood. Um, the bit that is the challenge is what I call data in the wild. Mm. It's this data that's sitting on endpoint devices, mm. laptops, mobile phones, cloud applications, growing like video, remote servers, branch servers that are sitting in the middle of nowhere, not, badly, not well managed. And as we move on to things like GDPR, how many tapes are sitting in vaults that have never been looked at for 20 years 
that's now containing personal identifiable information that come the hour, come the day, are going to have to be pulled out and searched through. And this is the challenge. This is the challenge for me with regard to some of these new legislation that's coming in place. It's new legislation, but it's having to address old technology that is still in situ. Well, let's use that as a neat segue to, um, to GDPR then. But so what, what we've talked about data location as it is in 2017. Um, everybody around this table and hopefully everybody watching is well aware that the general data protection regulation is coming, um, coming our way. It's, it's, already, um, it's already been finalised. It becomes enforceable around about this time next year, the 25th of May 2018. Um, what's the purpose of GDPR, Sue? <laughs> catching up with the uh, technology that's what that is um, so my uh, the simplistic summary of GDPR is is um, uh, keeping us honest about how we use data basically um, so we've had data protection act in place for however long 20 odd years it's just bringing it up to date and saying we've, we've been nice to you we've asked you to be nice with the data and now we're going to tell you properly how to be nice with it and we're going to really slap you hard if you don't um, yeah would you agree with that Chris I think so. I think you go back to when the DPA was was put in place. Things Data Protection Act. The Data Protection Act. Yes. Jargon. Uh, sorry. You. Sorry. <laughs> so the Data Protection Act put in place. Google wasn't around. Facebook wasn't around. The data that's basically being generated and being used for all these different things is is now very different and very dynamic compared to what it is. And you've got all of the you know the PPI type organisations that have been chasing and ambulance chasing and all the other things and the nuisance sort of aspects associated with this. I need to have the ability to turn around and say no to this sort of stuff from time to time if I, if I feel it's getting out of hand. And, and that's one of the things. If you're looking after my data and the GDPR is all around the privacy of information for, for, for you know, the EU residents that are out there today, I want to make sure that my data is being used correctly. And, and I want to know that if I don't want you to use my data, then, then and I want to have that conversation with somebody to say stop doing it. So the GDPR is, um, is coming into force for, for one of two reasons. The first one I think is, is as you say, it is an attempt to, to bring it a bit more up to date and, and it's foolhardy to try to keep completely up to date or, or at least ahead of um, te technological developments because um, they're happening so fast. But, but having some kind of awareness of the internet and how it's being used mm -hmm. in the modern era will, will be very helpful. The second reason for it, of course, is to try to harmonise yeah. what the directive itself wasn't done. So without getting too uh, boring or technical, um, the, the EU directive was passed um, 20 years ago to allow member states to interpret that up to a point to, uh, into their own law. Um, that wasn't massively successful, and, and uh, Germany is one of the uh, areas where it, um, they, they've got a bit of gold plating on otherwise essentially the same law. And the idea, of course, is that the regulation will lift it out of the remit of the member states up to EU level, so there will be no national implementation, there will be no interpretation as such. It's the, the text is the text, and that's, that's what the law is. Um, there will be some uh, regional um, variations and, and a bit more gold plating, but for, for now, that's, um, that's the purpose of it. And do you see business changing as a result of this, Rick? Do I see business changing as a result of it? Um, business is going to have to change, I think, if they are to comply with the legislation as I interpret it um, at the present time. Because the whole idea of GDPR is it's not something you add on to what you're doing every day in your business. You've got to build the programs and the processes and the, uh, the activities um, into the GDPR program. The, the challenge, I say, going back to my previous point, is that from the conversation I'm having with companies, depending on whether they're SMEs or they're, they're large global organizations, is some of them don't even know it exists. It's going to come into play. Um, others have an interpretation of it, which I suggest is not accurate. Yep. And, and then perhaps larger, more sophisticated organizations are all over it like a rash. Um, with more consultants in place and lawyers with respect um, than, uh, than they can count. Respect to the lawyer. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so I think there's a, it, it, is, it is a very, very confused landscape at the present time. And you know, some of the people around this room are trying to help with the solutions we have. But there is a huge amount of work for them to better understand where is their data in the first place being able to collate that data and then come the hour, come the day when Sue says, I invoke the right to be forgot. How are they going to do this? And should they have a data breach? Mm. They've got 72 hours, if memory serves me right, to tell the um, to tell the authorities. Um, 
I think this is almost like asking um, Turkey to vote for Christmas at the end of the day. Well, we're going to cover GDP in a bit more detail later on in the series, so let's uh, keep some of those exciting tidbits for, for <laughs> later on in the series. I'd like to think they're exciting, for us. <laughs> <laughs> is it only the lawyers who ever get <laughs> excited about the law? Um, but John, you said that you give customers the, the, the choice to, if you want your data stored in France, UK, Germany, yeah. where it happens to be, then, then that's exactly where you can put it. Um, mm. It's not true of all public cloud that the customers either know where it is or that they have the, have the choice to, to put it there. Do you think that GDPR will change the approach to data location from a customer's perspective? Are they asking you anything different? Um, Those ones who are aware of so, GDPR? So, so again, coming back to the, the point we were just on, you know, I, I, I've got, I run a team of people across Europe who help clients implement clouds or implement cloud solutions. And it is interesting noticing where, you know, so I, I've got a colleague in Germany who is basically working with a client in real time, you know, to help them implement a GDR, GDPR compliant capability. Actually, they're doing the gold plating. They're doing, taking GDPR as the base and then they're adding on top of it because that's what they believe they need to do. Um, I see other colleagues working in other European countries who maybe are, haven't yet been faced by the question. You know, the, the clients are either not asking it because they may be unaware, or they've not yet gotten to a point of having to sort of decide to start doing something about it. But, but I think as we approach that deadline, I think there will be more and more focus on, you know, what are you doing about this? It is coming down the pipe, you know, mm -hmm. it is, it's not something you're going to be able to duck and weave around. And at that point in time, I think, much as I hate to say it, there will be a lot of last minute panic or solutioning going on to go, oh dear, this thing is going to happen next month, what do we do about it? And, and probably by that time it's a little bit too late. Yes, and at that point it's going to come back and people are going to go, okay, Mr. Cloud Provider or Ms. Cloud Provider, what are you going to do to help me to get us over There's this? certainly growing awareness of GDPR, yeah. not, not just around this. Mm. Uh, not just around this panel, but obviously in the, in the wider world. There's an awful lot of GDPR experts who have uh, suddenly sprung up overnight who can guide you through the, the, the process who weren't there um, even just a few months ago, um, which, which, is, which is a good thing, hopefully, that people are at least thinking about the issues that, that they need to um, address to become compliant with the new regulation. Um, but equally, there's, there's part of me that, that says, um, echoing what you just said, both of you, is that there is actually a great proportion of the people out there who aren't aware of GDPR and the need to become compliant and um, part of me thinks that well given that it's going to become enforceable this time next year the first time at which they might really take pay attention to it is when the first fine is, is levied yeah, yeah. and, and as we all know that the fines are going to jump from uh, in the UK at, at the moment 500k to 4% um, of global turnover or 20 million euros, whichever is, whichever is the bigger. So I've been telling clients that the TalkTalk Talk case, which was decided a, a year or two ago, um, where they received um, a £400,000 fine for um, some basic data protection security errors, um, they got 80% uh, of the maximum fine. If that were to be recalculated under the GDPR mechanism, that would probably be about £56 million. Wow. So, it changes from being a, an affordable um, irri irritation, if you like. Um, we bridge to mitigate. Well, let's, let's pay the fine. And I'm um, not saying that that's what TalkTalk's approach was, but certainly some of the cynics in the industry have said that certainly at the lower level, it's, it's cheaper just to pay the fine than it is to yep. implement data security. Yep. Whereas going forward from this time next year, it, it will not be, be affordable at, at all. Is that the sense that you're getting, Chris? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, so we. We've recently did a, did a survey of customers about, you know, we've been doing a lot of education, like I'm sure everybody around the table, educating ourselves as much as educating our customers about what it's all about. And one of the, one of the survey questions we said is, based on these fines, what, are you, what is your biggest worry about GDPR coming down the line? And we're already hearing some of the regulators in certain countries ready to make an example of organizations. They want to make an example of organizations that are in, in that breach. And a lot of them are thinking about the size of the fine being either business crippling or business ending. That's right. Yes. Yeah, well, it's, it's 4% yeah. of global turnover. Yeah. It's not 4% of UK profits. So, Absolutely. So this is a business changing event if you get caught with them. Yeah. To be fair, though, I think the Information Commissioner in the UK is fairly pragmatic, fairly commercial. And provided you've taken some steps towards it, then she's probably not going to punish you with a full 
four uh, percent. Um, but I think it's fair to say that there are probably some other supervisory authorities, perhaps in Germany, who are who, who will be looking to take an early scalp. Um, yeah. is, is, is Germany a threat? Do you think, John? A threat in what sense? A threat to uh, that your customers who are looking to do business out there, if, if they get it wrong, if, if they store the data incorrectly, they're liable to a, a massive fine on day one. I, I think you know. Coming back to the conversation at the beginning, you know, I think the attitude to data protection and privacy in Germany, in particular, is at such a level that I think it is probably higher up the so agenda. So they're probably more well advanced than the average. I, I, I think in the so. UK. I think it's probably fair, actually. If you were yeah. to ring a German business and ask to speak to the data protection officer, they'd probably put you straight through. Whereas if you were to ring a, a UK mm. business and ask the same question, you, you'd probably get stuck at reception hold. without them. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hold when I speak to my marketing yeah. department? And marketing is probably not the place that you need to be. But is there a requirement for, for, for a DPO to look after the location of your data, do you think, a, a data protection officer? Well, they're, they're already saying that in, in Europe, they, you're going to be looking at tens of thousands of DPOs basically getting, getting their roles in, in place. There's a couple of things, obviously, that you're talking about. Is it, 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 are some of these things a, a threat also? Um, I think it's an opportunity. If you can get your house in order and show that you are, in essence, treating people's data correctly and you're actually using it for the right purposes, you can actually go after, in essence, attracting more customers, more, more people associated with it. So the, th the, the turning around and using the, 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 the carrot versus the stick analogy, a good DPO, a DPO will, will sit down and go, this is all about doing the right thing because it can help us do new things as well and actually starting to look at the opportunity that it can create by doing the right things with people's data is actually the better approach to, to, to a data protection officer's you know, mm. chance of, of basically making yeah. GDPR stick. Most people get fed up with being beaten up all the time, being fined for doing things, when actually they're asking for assistance and assist, you know, help to basically make it work. What, what is nice that we've been hearing a lot more is it's raised uh, data protection and data use from marketing and a business perspective from being the data team's problem to being a board conversation. It's certainly a business So there is support now. now. It, it it's has a to, thing. And like I said, we're going to cover GDPR in a bit more detail later on in the series and we'll talk it's specifically about whether you need to appoint a data protection officer in your business. So for now, turning back to um, GDPR in respect of uh, how it affects data location, um, what's the sense that um, in the market that Brexit will have, have an effect on GDPR? Do you know, Rick? Well, it's interesting because <coughs> we've now got companies who are either solely based in United Kingdom or England, or indeed they are headquartered here and they are already making provision that their operations here have got local data centres yeah. with their local data in, in the UK and Ireland, as opposed to perhaps in Southern Ireland or in Frankfurt, wherever the case may be. So back to John's point, I think they're taking the view, let's get ahead of the curve to some extent. We don't want to be exposed come the hour, come the day of Brexit, that we've got data in another sovereign country, perhaps under the auspices of another country in terms of the ownership of the infrastructure. We just want to better control it over here. So we are working, perchance, uh, present time, very, very closely with um, one of the large public sector cloud providers purely to give them that capability. Companies who want to have their data resident within England, the UK and Ireland, and not within the broad European uh, community. So yeah, it's definitely got people's attention at the present time. What's your feel, Sue? Do you think that um, Brexit and GDPR are, are big issues and the, the people that you're talking to, are they saying we, we need to um, keep our data in the UK now because we don't know where Brexit is going to go. I Brexit means Brexit, but what does it mean? I just think it's so unknown that people don't know what to worry about first. And yet JP Morgan have bought a, a large building in Dublin to be yeah, able to yeah. move their staff to just in case the Brexit deal yeah. doesn't go their way. So people are already like taking... Protection. No, but, in the but, context of data protection. but it's, it's about Brexit. Is there a sense that um, Brexit's going to change things in um, so data fair. location or data protection? Uh, possibly, but not because of data protection laws or because of GDPR. Possibly for commercial reasons or for other um, maybe political reasons. I, I can see that, but I don't think the data protection is a particular driver of those decisions. Plus okay. also, we are also still going to be in the EU by the time GDPR, yeah, GDPR picks up. So yeah. we, we can't ignore it. 
Yeah. Okay. And I, I did read a headline um, about a month back, actually, when I was doing one of my GDPR talks, saying that one in four businesses have cancelled their GDPR preparation on the basis that Brexit will mean that uh, GDPR will not come to force. So, <laughs> wow. so if you're watching this thinking that Brexit will kill off a nice piece of EU yeah. regulation called GDPR, then, no. um, then you're wrong. <laughs> you need to get back to preparing. Um, but some of the decisions might, might be based around where my, my, where my data is located. If, if uh, we're going to be outside of the single market and it looks like w whatever deal we end up with will be a form of hard Brexit taking us out of the um, fortress Europe, to fortress data Europe, in which case then we will be outside of the, the single market for those purposes. So um, we will, you're right, we, we will have to comply with GDPR before we, do, before we do a Brexit. All the indications from the government are that um, GDPR compliance will not be one of the things that falls to, to be repealed under yes. the Great Repeal Bill, or whatever that will end up being called. Um, a Great Repeal Bill won't actually repeal many things. It will probably preserve most things, and GDPR will probably be, um, be, will be one of those. Um, so, so is there a sense then that we need to move data into the UK? Is that what you're saying? Some customer, you're getting some customers geared up to protect the data inside they're, the UK? They're going both ways, Frank. Either they're deciding that they're going to move their data into the European Union because they want to be an integral part of that. Or converse, they're saying if we're going to be outside the European Union, then they want to have the data resident within the United Kingdom. Um, you can argue the rationale for that either way, but they're just like they're making provision, they're making, they're making reasonably informed judgments that this is going to have Brexit is going to have a profound impact one way or the other, but not being clear as to what that is. Yeah. So they can do it because they yeah. can. To, to John's point, it is not difficult to move data from location to location. So why wouldn't you do it and at least remove? That potential challenge, yes. yeah, and crack on with the other things. If that you have the choice challenge. within your cloud infrastructure or the particular cloud service that you, as a customer, are buying, and that allows you to to designate a country or a region, then certainly that makes sense. But at the moment, there, there's a feeling from some of the people that I speak to that they put it out to the public cloud, and they have no they have no clue where it is. It's not necessarily Stamford Street SE1 or London or the UK. It's just it's just out there. I don't know where it is. Is that is that a fear? Is, is that why you're, you've got lots of different? So things? so so. so I think you know we, we've never had that issue because we've always been very clear about you know it will be where you've put it and it's not going to move you know and and to come back to to Rick's point you know we we already decided to expand our data center footprint here in the UK because of client needs and actually that decision was made prior to the Brexit referendum. And it's actually worked quite well because yeah. people are now going, to your point, you know, I might need to move everything into the UK, whereas today I might have it split across um, a, a UK data centre and one somewhere else in Europe. I can now move it back and I can still do the DR and I can still do all the things that I wanted to do, but I have the ability to bring it back this side of the channel this is the power of the, this is the power of the cloud over having on-prem infrastructure yeah. although if you were if you did have on-premise infrastructure your data would probably be based in the uk anyway yeah. so <laughs> to brexit wouldn't matter yeah, there's, that. A, there's another conversation around that which we'll probably on another session i should think but, but to that point though, i agree with john they've got the flexibility to be able to do it why wouldn't they they do that and most organizations and i don't know whether john's organization is the same but there are very strict service level agreements these days as to where your data is going to be. It will not be moved unless you want to move it or you move it. So it depends who you're talking to as your public service infrastructure provider. But those service level agreements are, are in place today. Yeah. yeah. And a big driver, as you say, it's cloud versus on-prem versus UK versus Europe. Big driver of that being other systems, not actually data protection. Yeah. Okay. How interactive they are. That's yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to take that as your uh, final um, point on that on that topic. Chris, do you have any final pointers for us? I, I, one of the things that I do is I spend a lot of time actually in countries that are not part of the EU. And in fact, they're now waking up to the fact that this is about the privacy <coughs> of people that reside in the EU. And they, if they want to continue to do business with those sorts of organizations, take an airline for an example, if they want to do business with that sort of person, they've got to treat their data under the, under the rules of GDPR and they're starting to wake up to it. Yeah. They're starting to realize actually they are liable to, 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 to these sorts of fines potentially and that would stop them potentially even trading. Uh, EU data protection standards being exported exactly, across, across exactly. the globe. So really What's your final comment on, on uh, this? My final comment would be, um, you know, tough as this is going to be, I think, for companies, the first thing they have to do is to work out where is their data in the first place and be able to, to consolidate that in such a way that they can start to fulfill mm. some of these PII responsibilities. 
most of these companies have got no idea where their data is. And John, over to and, you. And, and I think the other point, which again we touched on at the beginning, is it's what is appropriate. You know, there, are, there will be certain classes of data that will remain on premise for many companies. There will be other sorts of data that it is perfectly okay to put out into the cloud. And actually being able to understand the value of the data and the security that needs to be wrapped around it is key to understanding you know, where on that sort of potential spectrum you're going to put it. Brilliant. OK, thank you, everybody. That's, uh, that's it for the first uh, episode of Technology and the Law. Um, I've been your host, Frank Jennings, and today I was joined by John Easton from IBM, Rick Powell from Druva, uh, Chris Bridgeland from Veritas, mm -hmm. and Sue McClure from Persona. Thank you very much to, to our panel. We hope, you'll, um, hope you found that very uh, interesting and useful, and hopefully you'll tune back in next week when we'll be talking about cloud contracting risks. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.